Welcome to A Course in Miracles, Chapter 15. We continue where we let off, let, uh, stopped last night. And so tonight we start on 15.7, The Needless Sacrifice. Again, let's acknowledge the presence of the Christ mind within us, within ourselves, and God's Holy Spirit um, as the memory of God in us, um, calling us back to remember ourself as that which is the Holy Son of God, the shared being with God. And this is one of the, the old teachings of Jesus, the old biblical Bible teachings of Jesus brought back into a new way of seeing it from a non-dual perspective. And one of the, the important lessons Jesus taught was, I seek mercy, not sacrifice. Meaning mercy means forgiveness. And sacrifice is an idea that we, we, we establish somewhere along the line as we start to become God, non-dual conscious. And we start to believe that we're sinners and we've got to get rid of everything in order to be more holy. And nothing can be further from the truth truth because the minute you make anything real in this world um, and then want to get rid of it you've made it real and so it's in making it real and trying to get rid of it you've made it real so it's the realization that there's nothing to get rid of there's nothing to sacrifice but everything to see anew see another way and realize everything is an extension of your dreaming mind you as the the son of god dreamer not you as a localized body mind realizing at first you see yourself as a localized body mind but as you extend and expand and remember yourself you realize you're dreaming this whole in universe and everybody in it and yes you may still be seeing it from a from an individual perspective but as the christ mind takes over as the holy spirit leads you to the christ mind you'll start to realize that not only is the world, your brother, your salvation, because you're, they become mirrors of you, showing you that you're ascending in consciousness to awakened awareness, to the knowing of yourself as a shared being with God. So the, the needless sacrifice really says there's no need for sacrifice. And it brings us into where is sacrifice most prevalent? And of course, in relationship. And so it also brings up the, the special love relationship as one of the ego's primary mechanisms, tools for keeping us in sacrifice. And let's explore this. And I will give as many examples as possible. And I'll go quite slowly through this one because there are some challenging understandings that we need to absorb and bring ourselves into into clarity so the needless sacrifice beyond the poor attraction of special love relationships so the holy spirit saying to us even in that passionate moment when you meet someone and you fall in love it's still very poor attraction in terms of what true attraction is if you can imagine the call that you have from within for love for knowing love of course you think it's outside you when you're trapped in duality but at some stage in the non-dual understanding, you you come to that realization, love is calling myself to be, to be the love I am. So beyond the poor attraction of special love relationships and always obscured by it. So special love relationships, obstacles to peace, because they obscure what love really is, is the powerful attraction of the father for his son. So all our desires for relationships, for love, for happiness, is actually God's call to his son, you, <clears throat> as the dreamer. Not just the localized body, because the localized body is not real. It's fractured off. It's the son that's fractured off. So he's calling every fracture to become the son, and the son to return to the father awakened. Because the traction between father and son is the, is the glue that holds the universe together in our dream, and is that which is God, the eternal love of God. There is no other love that can satisfy you. Relationships can't satisfy you. Only you can satisfy you. Relationships either become an obstacle to peace and the cause of all conflict in your life, or that which enhances 
your happiness because you're pouring your joy and love into it. But it can't satisfy you unless you know that which you are. And the reason we pursue relationships, people, places, things, and events is because we don't know what we are. And since we don't know what we are, we don't know we are the happiness, joy, love of God. So there is no love, other love that can satisfy you because there is no other love. God is love, pure love. And the closest we'll get to understanding, comprehending with clarity, love in this world, God's love, agape, the love of God, is the unconditional acceptance of one another and ourselves, and the realization that what we see isn't real, that the essence of all of it, that is love. So your spirit, your soul, for want of a better word, that is pure love because it's the extension of God. The rest that you think is you, body, is a projected misrepresentation of yourself. You, the dreamer. This is the only love that is fully given and fully returned. God's love is maximum. Being complete, it asks nothing. Love is not asking anything. And if you think of all special love relationships, there are terms of agreement. One of the great books of relationship in this world is John Gray, one of the great authors, John Gray, Men are from Mars, Women are from Venus. Or, you know, there's another one called When Mars and Venus Date or something like that, Dating Mars and Venus. Um, great relationship advice books. And then the other one, um, The Five Love Languages. If you think about it, they're, they're, they're actually tool mechanisms. Although John Gray does get into non-dual understanding. He was, he was a monk for a long time, so he did get that. He was Maharashi's. He was an assistant of Maharashi, chef, chef and, and chief bottle washer and, and cleaner for Maharashi. So he, he's, he's John Gray, great author, great teacher, um, has been exposed to non-duality, and it comes through in some of his work. But in general, if you think about rules of engagement and the whole shift of masculinity in the in the female and the feminization of the male and the con role confusions that's happening to our society. These are all ego personifications and projections. There is something beyond that. And so if two people come together in complete love, meaning absence of body, love, true love is the absence of body, and they come in, in into holy communion, holy companionship, walking each other home, then there's no need for rules because you have two people wanting to serve the love they are. They become symbols of, of the divine love of God in each other. But while we're in this world trapped in bodies thinking we can attain love outside ourselves, then there's all sorts of rules. Now there's love languages, way, ways that you show your love. I mean, if you were truly conscious in a relationship, you would know what the other person needs because the other person needs what? Love. <laughs> only The only thing we need is only one need that needs to be fulfilled, and that is love. Of course, there's derivatives of that need, which is the recognition of our being, our shared being. But it's still the need of love. Love is that which sustains us. Love is another word for life, the energy, the life force, which is life itself, the extension of God. Being wholly pure. Everyone joined in it has everything, and everyone is joined in it, in it, so everybody has everything, but people aren't awakened to that fact, so that they think they don't. This is not the basis for any relationship in which the ego enters. For every relationship on which the ego embarks is special, and specialness is another way of saying it's asleep. It's, it's specialness is ego. <clears throat> Excuse me. The ego establishes relationships only to get something. So you complete me. You know, and the goldfish included, Tom Cruise. You know, um, it's all romantic because now you become someone else's everything. And, and that's why breakups are so soul-destroying, heartbreaking, ego heartbreaking. Why? Because two halves come together, become one whole. And yet when they split, there's still two halves, not realizing completeness, completeness. When two completes come together, there's still just completeness. Okay, so 
It always wants to get something. And it would keep the giver to itself through guilt. So I'll give you this if you give me that. And if you don't, then you don't love me. And I may leave or I will punish you. It is impossible for the ego to enter into any relationship without anger. Now, that may be a little bit strange, but I'll explain it. Where's the anger? If I'm so romantic of someone, it's because we don't remember what we are. And there's a frustration. And anger is way below the subconscious awareness. And anger out of frustration for not knowing what we are, for believing that there's a vengeful God that wants to absorb our power and destroy us, which is the belief of the ego, we then go searching for love and we're attracted to, we're, we're turned on, we're aroused by others and we fall in love and we get passionate. And yet when that passion subsides because it's temporal, when the, when the fire of the ego burns out, what comes up? All the grievances and deep beneath all those grievances, unworthiness, um, lack of self-worth, the feelings of rejection, abandonment, separation, fear, guilt, comes anger. So underneath all relationships is anger, which is why, and you've seen it, people can go from I love you to I hate you very, very quickly. And of course, a myriad of judgments and, and rank order judgments in between. Well, the ego believes that anger makes friends. Why? Because there's an alliance you know, we get into tribes and tribes get angry together and attack other tribes. This is not its statement. It won't say it out loud, but it is its purpose. So behind everything is the ego's desire, is wish is that you don't know who you are and therefore don't remember your father and therefore don't return to your father, in which case, if you did, it dies. For the ego really believes that it can get and keep by making guilty. So I can attract into my life, you know, I've, made, I've, I've created this relationship, I've manifested this relationship, made it, and now I keep you by keeping you bound to needing me and behaving in a certain way whilst I won't give you approval. In male-female relationships, the male needs to be acknowledged. He needs to be told he's appreciated. And the feminine needs to be gifted appreciation. And so if I do little things for her, she will tell me how wonderful I am. And I need to be told I'm a hero because I don't believe I'm worthy enough. And unless I'm giving her appreciation and taking care of her and providing for her, uh, yes, I am talking traditional roles, but uh, let's use that for as an example. You know, if I'm not taking care of her and providing for her, well, then she doesn't need me. And then she'll find someone else that can provide more. And so how do I keep her bound? By making her feel guilty that she owes me something. How does she keep me bound? By giving me little rewards and making me feel guilty if I don't, because then she will not open up. So this is traditional ego-based relationship. This is its one attraction. An attraction so weak that it would have no hold at all, except that no one recognizes what's actually happening behind, beneath every special love relationship. And always some form of sacrifice and compromise. For the ego always seems to attract through love. So is that old saying that men offer love in order to get sex and women give sex in order to offer love? Now, I know it's a primitive concept, but it's still alive and well in many a society. You know? And has no attraction at all to anyone who perceives that it attracts through guilt. No one's going to be in, interested in someone that makes you feel guilty from the onset. And yet the sociopathic ego behavior is very good at pulling you in, immediately making you feel unworthy, and then having to work for appraisal, work for validation. And therefore, the minute you don't believe yourself worthy, you find someone that's going to reflect that unworthiness back at you. And that's why people stay in relationships, even though their partners make them feel completely worthless, unworthy, guilty, sinful, ashamed, because they have this deep desire to, to prove themselves worthy, yet they never do because they don't believe they are. And their partner mirrors the fact that they're not. Why? Because that's the way the ego is planned it. And because we're not aware of our Christ mind, our Holy Spirit within us, we bind to the ego's belief that we're sinful, 
guilty, unworthy, therefore we've been rejected, we've been abandoned by God, and we're going to be punished one day. Because we're just not good enough, we must have done something wrong. The sick attraction of guilt must be recognized for what it is. For having been made real to you, so in other words, you believe that you've done something wrong. Don't believe you're dreaming, so you believe that this is real. It is essential to look at it clearly, and by withdrawing your investment in it, to learn to let it go, and learn to know when your ego kicks in, and, 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 and it comes up as desire for another, or to be desired, and that's how it traps you and them and keeps you both trapped. No one ch would choose to let go what he believes has value. Yet the attraction of guilt has value to you only because you have not looked at what it is and have judged it completely in the dark. So do you value you as the Holy Son of God? What do you value you as a body mind? And so when you look at it in the light of awareness, you won't want it anymore. As we bring it to the light, your only question will be why it was that you've ever wanted it. Why did I ever need this? If I am whole, if I am complete, why did I need that? Now, it doesn't mean we have to be alone. It doesn't mean that you that you don't deserve a holy companion. By all means, if if that still calls to you, but realize why is it calling to you? Because in that holy companionship relationship, you are going to show each other the, the remnants, the last bits, the echoes of your subconscious guilt. If you have got, gotten rid of all guilt completely, there is no more attraction in you for another body because you'll realize that what you look upon isn't attractive. Now, I'll give you an example. My pencil box girlfriend, was Christy Brinkley, scrawny little, Christy Brinkley, blonde hair, tiny little thing. And that became the hook. Thereafter, you know, pretty little legs to go all the way up to heaven and make an ass of themselves. Very spiritual term. That became the mold. And I would pursue that and pursue that most of my teenage and young adult life. I met my wife. She fitted the mold. The minute that mold, abandoned, rejected, cheated, lied, that mold became a no-go. It looked for a different mold. And so all my resentment, fear, guilt, sin, anger was projected towards the mold. Why did I ever want it? Because I believed if I had her in my life, I'd be happy. Just the opposite. She brought up all the, the guilt in me. And not realizing it was in myself, I projected it her. What did she project back at me? All the insecurities. So I became the press button that made her feel insecure. I be she became the press button that made me feel guilty. The relationship was doomed to fail. Of course, now in hindsight, I realize how that relationship was so beautiful to bring me into the awareness of becoming aware as I got to a place where I said, there must be a better way to do this. And so forever grateful for that relationship. But if you can't be grateful for your past relationships, for bringing you to another state of awareness and you're still holding them in bondage and still blaming them for what you went through or for leaving you or abandoning you or rejecting you or cheating on you or whatever, then you don't realize you've created it all and you can't transcend it because you want to hang on to that anger. You want to hang on to that guilt because it makes you feel better because at least you're taking someone else, not realizing that if you have anger, guilt, fear in you, you're resonating that frequency. Not only do you make the body-mind sick, that's where all disease comes from and hence why we'll never find a cure for cancer because a cancer is just the negative unloved emotions stuck in the body that then fight and, and attack themselves. But also you'll never attract a holy relationship with the divine and or every relationship you attract will just again bring up all that guilt and you'll, you'll think everybody else is to blame, never realizing it's you. So every relationship, look closely at what it's showing reflecting back at you. And, and, and even holy companionships, two people walking each other home, are going to trigger those buttons, are going to press those buttons so that you can bring it up and do the forgiveness exercise. Everything comes back to forgiveness. Your only function on this, in this world, you've only got one. Forgive until there's nothing more to forgive. 
And only then can the self be realized because you need total clarity, no filters of guilt, sin, and fear in the way for the self to be fully known as that which is the shared being of God. You have nothing to lose by looking open-eyed. Or well, ugliness such as this belongs not in your holy mind. Get, bring that guilt to the surface. Clean it. This host of God can have no real investment here. So the host of God, the Holy Spirit, is your highest self. Okay, You can't have an investment in body-mind relationships. Now, if you're in a relationship, make that relationship holy. Make that relationship a dedication to the serving of your awakened awareness. And, and how will you get that? Through serving the awakened awareness of your brothers. But don't hold anyone special because you will be trapped. It's the, it's the wonderful teaching by Rupert Spira where he says, you know, get rid of the old wedding vows and say, I love you, but I don't need you. So I have no expectations on what you want to be. If you choose to be with me, you choose to be with me. Not because I'm special, not because you're special. You don't love me more than anyone else. Love is. We just recognize that we're the love of God in, in temporal refracted body minds. But the essence of us is God, is the, is the son of God, one with God. We said before that the ego attempts to maintain and increase guilt. That's all the ego does. That's all it wants to do. It just wants to hold you in that place forever and a day. but in such a way that you do not recognize what it would do for you. This is the trick. This is what the ego wants to do. You'd never realize what it's doing to you because you're blaming it. You're so busy blaming everybody else all, and bringing up your past all the time that you don't realize it's your projection. For it is the ego's fundamental doctrine. And that's fundamental. The basis of what it does. That what you do to others you have escaped. Yet if you're attacking others, where's the attack thought in you? So what you give, you receive. Why? Because you're creating it. As a man judges, so he's judged. By what? Not by God. By himself. So that his judgment keeps him bound. The ego wishes no one well. Yet its survival depends on your belief, first of all, first and foremost, that you are exempt from its evil intentions. As if you're going to escape the ego not realizing the you that thinks you're going to escape the ego is the ego itself it counsels therefore that if you are host to it it will enable you to direct its anger outwards thus protecting you well if it's in you projected outwards where is it in you and once you project it outwards does it die no it just it just keeps going and so that anger is inside you somewhere it's going to make you sick going to make you sick it's going to give you cancer okay and all body minds die but why do you want to go that way and thus it embarks on an endless unrewarding chain of special relationships forged out of anger and dedicated to but one insane belief that the more anger you invest outside yourself the safer you become now think of this world man we're so quick Two political parties attacking each other nonstop. People take sides, attack, demonstrate, bomb each other, go to war. This one's wrong. That one's wrong. We find it's the global warming, cooling, climate change, batteries versus petroleum, wind power versus. It's just continuous at each other, looking for fault, looking to attack, looking to attack, making everybody to be a sinner, make everybody's evil. Everybody's evil. I can promise you most people, even if they're creating wars and war machines, all just want to do the best they can. They're doing the best. Everyone is doing the best they can. Yes, there are some corrupt, evil minds that want to control the world for their own wealthy gains. Of course, there's always going to be. It's just greed. It's greed. What is evil but the absence of love? And just greed, selfishness, because they fear dying. So they want to live as long as possible and hope they can live through their families that stay behind once they've gone. It is this chain that binds the Son of God to guilt. And it, is, it, it, and it is this chain the Holy Spirit would remove from your holy mind. For the chain of savagery 
belongs not around, not around the chosen host of God who cannot make himself host to the ego. The real you can't. So it's just a temporal hallucination. It's almost like you've taken shiitake mushrooms and now you spit that stuff out. Spit that ego out. Okay, forgive it out. Spitting it out means forgiven. In the name of his release and in the name of him who would release him, Holy Spirit, let's look more closely at the relationship the ego contrives. So Christ okay, has removed the ego. Let's learn of him. Let's look closely and realize how. And then let the Holy Spirit judge them truly. For it is certain that if you will look at them, you will offer them gladly to them. Take this from me. Release this. I no longer need this. Mm -hmm. But there's a deep fear in us. And the fear is that if I no longer have a relationship, I'm going to be lonely. When you are fully aware of the self as the holy extension of God's love, you will know God. And in God, there's no loneliness. It's beyond your comprehension how it's impossible to feel lonely when you're consciously aware of the essence of life itself as God is flowing through you to everything. You are so filled with God's Holy Spirit, God's essence, God's Holy Spirit, God's essence, same thing, that there is not, no need for anything. And again, like I say before, you don't have to trust me or believe me. Just go. Go there yourself. See what happens. Never trust anyone. Trust the self. Because the self in everyone is trustworthy. What he can make of them, you do not know. You, 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 I didn't have the slightest comprehension what I was in for when I went in this direction. But yet I was so willing to let go of the old way that I went anyway. And the more, closer I got to that awakened self and light, the light of the, the awareness of being aware, the light of God, the light of the Holy Spirit, the heart, light of the Christ mind, it just kept giving me proof. And what once was an angry, lonely person, angry at the world, he thought he was a, he thought he was special, thought he was different, thought he was whatever, but he felt so lonely, so abandoned, so rejected by this world, and 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 yet wanted to do good, but still felt hurt and felt intense hurt, and 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 that hurt just made him the Batman. He put on the mask and he hid, he hid behind his toys and his money and his wealth and his career and his qualifications and his stature and his and his title and but inside he was vulnerable and hurt but as soon as he came close to that light and those shields of illusionary protection disappeared the joy started to lift and the loneliness started to subside it came up every now and again it became lonely on weekends lonely on a friday night and then the weekends disappeared and the friday night wasn't so intense and eventually it just lifted and take it from someone who felt this intensity of loneliness an intensity of separation an intensity of, of of rejection and abandonment and of betrayal it's impossible to imagine i was that guy it's impossible to imagine i could ever have felt that way because there is no loneliness. There's a lot of aloneness, but the wanting of aloneness, because in the aloneness, the all oneness comes through in the silent meditation of life itself. I'm not talking sitting there going like it's just meditation is life. It's the present awareness of being aware, even while you're doing activities, because the awareness becomes all pervading. And when in that all pervading awareness of the self, the Holy Son of God self, that which is the shared being with God, knowing yourself as that essence. There's no space for anything but being yourself lovingly, authentically. And yes, the personality is still there. Don't look upon a brother and see the personality and judge him for it. Don't do that to yourself and judge this to yourself. It's not about judging this. Don't do it to you. And so as you release this, and release any expectation of me or anyone else for that matter. And allow that light and open that door. Don't worry about shadows. If you've opened, if that room is filled with light and that door is wide open. And the shadow steps into the doorway. How long do you think the shadow is going to last? How, long, how far into the room do you think a shadow can walk? 
if that room is pure light. The shadow will peep around the corner, look through the doorway and go, no, hell no. Like a vampire going into the sun. It'll, the light of the sun, the vampire comes close and fizzles. The vampire is like the ego mind. It's dead. It's, it's not an illusion. The minute it steps into the life, which is the sun, it dissolves. Don't you ever worry. Just keep going. And please believe me when I tell you, well, don't believe me, but go there. Believe yourself that I went through this and I went through such darkness and such loneliness that if I cried, I would have cried a river. And as a cowboy, some cowboys don't cry. They just get on their, their iron horses and ride like maniacs 300 kilometers an hour to get rid of their hurt and pain and suffering. And, um, and that just dissipates and just dissipated and dissipated and the light just grew and grew. And now I'm happy, mostly. Mostly, most of the time. But you will bring, but you will become willing to find out. And I, I urge you, don't stop. There'll be times where you feel so lonely, so sad, so desperate, you know, possibly even suicidal, because that's like, there's no way out. Well, how do I get, I can't deal with, I can't handle this pain anymore. I can't handle this loneliness anymore. I just want it out. I just want out. So, because beyond this pain, there is something beyond your wildest, fancifulest, most amazing imagination is something beyond it that I could never have conceived of. And yet now I can't conceive of having been that. I can't even go there because there's no past anymore for me. There's a, there's a little distant memory of a very lonely boy. So if you are willing first to perceive of what you've made of them. So look, let's look upon what we've made and what we want special love relationships to be. In another, in one way or another, every relationship the ego makes, and this can be colleagues, bosses, parents, children, lovers, spouses, all of it, okay? Every human relationship is based on the idea that by sacrificing itself, it becomes bigger. And you hear people say things like it, but I did this all for you. You know, I, I, because they have the child and then they slave away at it because it's their fancy to be whatever they do. And then they need the gratitude back. And if they aren't getting the gratitude back, because they never give unconditionally, so they give only to get gratitude. And they say things like, but I did this all for you. I sacrificed myself for you. Do you know how much I sacrificed for you, you little shit? How often do your parents say that? You had the children out of love, supposed to be. Surely you should want to give them unconditionally for the rest of your life. If you have children because you expect them to be something, act in a certain way, behave in a certain way, and give you love in a certain way, what have you gone and done? You've just gone and given birth to a little idol that's going to become your obstacle to peace. Eventually, that kid's going to go, enough. Unless you've turned him into a complete coward, which means you can hang on to them until you die, and then you leave behind a little coward in the world. Is that what you want to do? The love you've created, you think you've made, you've made love, and now you've made another body to worship you as the... How many people do that? How many single parents in this world right now, or married couples? But I see that along uh, amongst a lot of, you know, parents, single parents. They go and have the child, sperm donor, blah blah blah, and then that little child's everything. Dress them up and uh, give them everything, or become hippies with them parents. That's either you know, Stepford Wives or or hippie foundations, and and then at some stage that kid's going to go now. Nah. And then what? And you're going to put guilt in them. You don't love mommy. You don't love daddy. You don't do it. Oh, my God. And I, I remember this wonderful line where someone said that people are in love and, oh, I want to have a child. And she said, is my love for you not enough that we still now need to have a child? Is your love, the love that you are not enough that we still now need to go and make another little projection? I can't remember the movie. But it was a good line. And so the sacrifice, which, re, which it regards as purification, is actually the root is actually the root of its bitter resentment because I do it for you because I need acknowledgement and I need validation and I need gratitude. But if you don't, I resent you. And I don't really want to do this, but you're my child, so I owe it to you. Duty, duty without love just turns to resentment and eventually hate and anger. For it, it would prefer to direct to to attack directly and avoid delaying what it really wants, 
Yet the ego acknowledges the reality, this world, as it sees it, and recognizes that no one could interpret direct attack as love. So it disguises its direct, uh, direct attack as guilt, unworthiness. You need to prove to me that you're worthy. Yet to make guilt is a direct attack, although it does not seem to be, because then you know it's things like prove to me you're worthy, show me your grades, you've got to be cleverer, you've got to work for your future, you've got to take care of mommy and daddy, we take care of you, look how much we've sacrificed for you, because we love you, we sacrifice for you, but one day you must take care of us. Oh, I love you, but only if you cook for me, I love you, only if you come home early, I, I love you if you do this and if you do that, and I love you. And I love you if you'll change your political party and agree with me. And I love you if you believe in God in the way I believe in God. I love you if, and it's always a byproduct. And if not, then, you know, and whoever the person, whoever has the most power in the relationship has the control. And power often comes in the form of fame, popularity, money, wealth, the other person is supported. So I buy you this and I buy you that and I buy you that and get rid of your job. I'll take care of you. Get rid of your car. I'll give you a new car. Everything's in my name. Everything's my my house, my name. Everything's mine. So if you don't behave, punish you. Leave you. Leave you alone in the street. Get someone else. Get a younger version of you to replace you. It happens every single day in this world. That's what passes for love. And then it's you and me against the world. For the guilty expect attack. Okay. So why? So only the untrustworthy that don't trust. So why are they untrustworthy? Because they expect other people to be untrustworthy. Because they are. Only the unloving don't love. Why? Because they don't believe they're un they don't believe they deserve it, and therefore they don't believe they'll receive it. So guilty people attack. Why? Because they believe they're going to be attacked because they're guilty. Okay. And having asked for it, what they do is they project it first and then attack. And they're not surprised when the world attacks you back. And they can never connect the dots. So you've just hurt someone, you've just hurt your child. Now you've been horrible, cruel. You go to the office and the boss is horrible. You don't understand why. Or you've hurt your wife, or you hurt your mother, or whatever the case is. You get in your car, and the truck rams you out off the road. You don't realize why. You haven't connected the dots. As you offer, so you receive. And since it's all one, every aspect of the, of the dream, the dream is activities. Every person, per place, thing, and event is reacting to your vibrational frequency, which means what you believe you are. What you believe you are, what you believe you have, you're attracting into your life. And having asked for it, they are attracted to it. And then they wonder why, oh, why is the world always attacking me? And that's why you have books like, why does why did bad things happen to good people? Why? Because good people don't believe they're good and don't believe they deserve to have the love of God. Because good people are continuously sacrificing. And as a consequence of sacrifice, there's a sense of resentment or expectation that is not met. And so as much as you want to do good because you want to people please because you want to be a good person because you need their appraisal, when you're not getting it, you get resentful. When you get resentful, you're in resistance. When you're in resistance, the world says, hello, yes, resistance more. It attacks and mirrors the resistance within you. And if that resistance is an attack thought, the world's always attacking you. That's why bad things happen to good people. In such insane relationships, the attraction of what you do not want seems to be much stronger than the attraction of what you do want. Why? Because the attraction of what you do not want is your highest form of vibrational resistance, and what you offer is what you attract. Law of attraction. For each one thinks that he has satisfied something, has sacrificed something to the other, and hates him for it. You hate each other. Yet this is what he thinks he wants. Because it also gives you the energy. Oh, and then you love this. You, oh, you can't get rid of that attack thoughts and guilt and attack and guilt. He is not in love with the other at all. He merely believes that he is in love with sacrifice. And how many people are in love with the idea of love? Love in, in love with the idea of relationship or loving relationship. That they'll, you know, their biological clock is ticking and they've got to 30 something. And now they have to marry the first person. And even though the last 10 didn't work out, he'll settle for this one because biological clock. I mean, I'm going to have kids by the time I'm whatever. And they just, they're feeling such resistance to what is. What do they attract? They attract the mirror, which is going to mirror the, 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 the resistance that they're feeling. And for this sacrifice, which he demands of himself, he demands that the other person accept the guilt and sacrifices himself as well. Forgiveness becomes impossible. 
because we want to point out each other's mistakes and want to get, you have to admit that you're wrong. You have to make it real. You have to admit that you're wrong and then I'll forgive you. You have to admit that you're wrong and then change your behavior. Make it real. For the ego believes that to forgive another is to lose him. So if I forgive you, if I release you, you'll just go off in somewhere and then I'm going to be alone again. So let me make you feel guilty, even though I don't like you. Let me make you feel guilty for sacrificing for you. But I'm going to be resentful if you're not giving me back at least twice as much. It is only by attack without forgiveness that the ego can ensure the, that the guilt holds all relationships together. And, and pay close attention to dualistic, non-conscious relationships, even people that have been together for years. Ask, ask them, what do you love about each other? I'll take you back to the history. When I first met her, met her, when I first met him, you know, it was so romantic. And when he did this, and when he bought me that, and when he took me here, and he took me, all his activities in the past. No, no, tell me, ask yourself, why do you love him now? Not because he's your husband, not because he's your child, not because he's your father or your mother. Why do you love them? I'm going to give you all sorts of fanciful reasons I've read on the back of a postcard. Because he completes me, because he, why do you love him without explaining any activity? Why do you love him? Not because he does or she does or he did or he will, because she's my son, I'm supposed to love him. Not because of the relate. Why do you love him? And there's only one answer, because that's a reflection of this. And thank you for that. Because in essence, that is that. And that is the love of God. And that is the love of God. The love of God is reflected back at me in you you are a reminder of the i am you are the reminder of the christ in me christ in me acknowledges the christ in you the holy spirit in me acknowledges the holy spirit in you the father in me acknowledges the father in you i abide in god god abides in me we abide not as bodies as one in god i love you because love is all there is not because of what you've done but if you should bring me chocolate cake on a friday afternoon I love you for at least 11 minutes in a special way. Always going to come in through the back door and be very, very, very wary of that. Be very wary how the ego appropriates all your spiritual understanding and then comes in through the back door. And there's always a little clause. If, if, I love you, if, I love you, when. Okay. Yet they only seem to be together. So, you know, these only rela these relationships, people seem to get together. How, how many times have you seen in a restaurant, couples sitting in front of each other, not even talking? For relationships to the ego mean only that bodies are together, live together, you know, get married, move in together, build a house, build together. Okay. It is always this that the ego demands, and it does not object where the mind goes or what it thinks. For well, this seems to be unimportant. As long as you're together, quality time is a love language, quality time. As long as the body is there to receive its sacrifice, it is content. As long as you're there, as long as you sleep here next to me and go here and live in my house under my rules, you know, as long as I live in your home and you look after me, as long as you behave in a certain way, because to the ego, the mind is private and only the body can be shared. Ideas are basically of no concern, except as they bring the body of another closer or, or further away. And it is in these terms that it evaluates ideas as good or bad. What makes another guilty and holds him through guilt is good. So I'll keep you because you owe me. And I'll keep reminding you that you owe me. Uh, please do the dishes or you don't get 11 minutes tonight. Please wash, clean your bedroom or I won't take you to school tomorrow. Please get good grades or you don't get dessert. You know, if, so there's always a condition. It's ego relationships, my own language, are always transactional. There's always, a, there's always an exchange. Money, energy, favors, guilt. What releases him from guilt is bad because he would no longer believe that bodies communicate, and so he would be gone. So if I can't keep you bound by duty, guilt, 
the idea that you're not good enough. No one, I love this line. No one else will love you as much as I do. Often used. No one else will sacrifice himself so much that he puts up with your shit. No one else will put up with your shit as much as I do. No one will love you as much as I. No one will understand you as much as I. No one will do for you as much as I do. It's always that. Remember that if you leave. So I sacrifice, but I resent sacrificing, but I need you anyway. Because I can't actually imagine I'm worthy for anyone else. So it's my fear of being alone that I'll keep you, but I don't really want you there. And should I find someone who then lives my next fantasy, then I'll drop you like a hot potato. That's the, that's the ego conditioning. So generally, the happier person relationship is the one with the most power in whichever way they have power. Suffering and sacrifice are the gifts with which the ego would bless all unions. Suffering and sacrifice. And I mean, we go to war for our country. Go and kill another person for my country because I love my relationship, my country, my family. This is what we do. And those who are united at, at its altar accept suffering and sacrifice as the price of union. In their angry alliances, born of fear of loneliness, and yet dedicated to the continuance, continuance of loneliness, each seeks release from guilt by increasing it in the other. So I increase the guilt in you, you increase the guilt in me. I feel more lonely, you feel more lonely. And that's why people say that relationships drift apart. Why? We literally push each other away by projecting our guilt into one another, and we get lonelier and lonelier and lonelier, angrier and angrier and angrier. We become so attached to the angry, guilt-feeling, guilt-attacking, attack emotions and having someone else to blame for our, our problems that we actually stay attached to that. People stay together because they get the energy of attack, victim, attack, victim, and that's all they know. And yet each believes that this decreases guilt in him, which is the most bizarre thing because they constantly projecting, but how do you, how can you de decrease it? If it's flowing from you, it must be in you and therefore will be in you because it's flowing. Nothing flows out of you. It flows through you. So if you choose to offer guilt, guilt flows in and flows out. If you choose to offer love, as you open love, lo love flows in, but you first have to open. You first offer, it's then offered you. Why? Because it's always in you, the love it is. So Offer guilt, guilt comes in. Offer love from within, and the love of God flows in. The other always seems to be attacking and wounding him, perhaps a little in little ways, perhaps unconsciously, yet never without the demand of sacrifice. The fury of those joined at the ego's altar far exceeds your awareness because it keeps you so bound in that emotion, in that trauma, in that drama that you never have time to become aware of because awareness is unfocused, unfocused attention. It's just aware. The minute you focus attention, you objectify, you're in the dream. What the ego really wants, you do not realize. And what it wants is it wants to kill you. It wants to keep you bound by suffering until you die. Whenever you are angry, you can be sure that you have formed a special relationship with the ego with which the ego is blessed. Well, the anger is its blessing. Okay, so this was, this was me 25 years ago. I was always angry. And I had, and I, I, and I believed I was on a righteous, angry path. I was doing good. I was doing God's work. I was fighting for the country, fighting for my family and getting rid of anybody who got in the way. And what I was doing is just bounding myself to this nonsense. Whenever you are angry, you can be sure that you have formed a special relationship with the ego, which the ego is blessed, for anger is its blessing. Just an anger begets more anger. Anger takes many forms, but it cannot long be deceived. It cannot long deceive those who will learn that love brings no guilt at all. And what brings guilt cannot be love and must be anger. Oral, and she drives me crazy. It was even a song. She drives me crazy. This is it. We just carry on. And we just, uh, we stay together, drive me crazy. We go to, they, the buddies get together and they bitch about their wives. Wives get together 
They complain about their husbands. Kids get together and they hate their parents. And that's all we do. But we go back for dinner. We go back and we have Thanksgiving, yet no one likes anyone. We get together for Christmas dinner and Christmas lunch and Easter this and, and birthday parties. We can't stand each other. You resent going there, but you go there anyway so that you can feel good about proving the others that you're better than them. This is what the ego does. All anger is nothing more than the attempt to make someone else feel guilty. And this attempt is only is the only basis for the ego, is the only basis the ego accepts for special relationships. Guilt is the only need the ego has. And as long as you identify with it, guilt will remain attractive to you. Yet remember this, to be with the body is not communication. And if you think it is, you will feel guilty about this communication and will be afraid to hear the Holy Spirit, recognizing in his voice your own need to communicate. And why will you fear it? Because you'll realize it's the end of ever desiring what you think you desired or still desire or think you want. Because you'll just put it down and, and, and you will no longer need bodies. You'll be fully content in the awareness of being aware. I couldn't imagine that. I was always that one woman guy. I was the guy that was in long-term relationships. You know, it was important for me to be there, to be supportive, to be needed. If you wanted to be provider, I needed to provide, I needed to take care, I wanted to make sure people were okay, you know, looked after everybody I can still do in many ways in terms of family, but in terms of my special love relationships, I needed to be that guy, I needed to be needed, I needed to be wanted, I wanted to be there, I wanted to be the good guy, I wanted to be the hero. I couldn't imagine being alone. Well, Twenty years on, twenty years, twenty-two, twenty-two years. I live alone. It's quiet. I have two cats, and I'm happy. Mostly, mostly. There are times when it catches me. But it's small now. It's, it's silly things like the bike won't start. Or the bike won't start. <laughs> they all seem to. Batteries all go at the same time. Okay. The Holy Spirit cannot teach through fear. And yet, that's how we do. If you don't pass, you fail. And how can he communicate with you while you believe that to communicate is to make yourself alone? Because you honestly, we do believe, and I, I certainly did. I certainly did. I believe that the path of self-mastery, which I wanted more than anything else in the world, more than even a special love relationship, which I wanted too. But I honestly believe that it was part of a past of self-mastery is a lonely one. And then the realization came 10, 12 years ago. It doesn't have to be. Because this path of self-mastery is the only one, not lonely one. Misspelt. Only one. Not the lonely one. It is, it is clearly insane to believe that by communicating, you will be abandoned. Yet many believe it. For they think their minds must be kept private or they will lose them. But if their bodies are together, their minds remain their own. And why don't we want to share our minds? Because we've got all that pent up guilt and perversion and idolatry in our minds. We don't want other people to know because if people know what we're thinking or what we think about ourselves, first and foremost, people won't love us. And if the Holy Spirit then knows what's in my mind, how could I possibly go to heaven? Because then the Holy Spirit's going to know what's in my mind. And it's all sin, fear, guilt, revenge, remorse, and all the fantasies we have and all the fantasies of attack and murder and whatever. And so the union of bodies thus becomes a way in which they would keep their minds apart. And very often, not even communicate at all, not even talk. For bodies cannot forgive. They can only do as the mind directs. Therefore, you can't enlighten through the body. You can't awaken through the body. 
the illusion of the autonomy of the body and its ability to overcome loneliness is but the working of the ego's plan, plan to establish its own autonomy. As long as you believe that to be with the body is companionship, and please remember this holy teachers of God, holy companionship is not two bodies together. Holy companionship is you and the Holy Spirit. Holy relationship, and this is something course people get wrong all the time, isn't between you and another body. That's not a holy relationship. There's only one holy relationship. It's you and God. Now, a body may be there, and it's holy relationship too, if the recognition of our shared being is there first and foremost. But you're not going to have a holy relationship with a special love. Oh, it's all romantic. We love each other. We complete each other. That's special love relationship. Yes, within each being is the essence of the divine, the shared being, because there's only one of us. And so, yes, every relationship is a holy relationship. But when seen with Christ's eyes, not seen with the ego's eyes, where you see yourself separated by bodies. The Christ love is the recognition that love is the absence of body. Ego's love is love is the connection of body, the joining of body the togetherness of bodies, the communion of bodies. That's not love. That's ego desire to keep love away by keeping you focused on body needs and guilt and fear. So as long as you believe that to be with a body is companionship, you will be compelled to attempt to keep your brother in his body held there by guilt. And that's why we also get upset when bodies die. And you will see safety in guilt and danger in communication. And that's why people are afraid of coming into my proximity, because I know what you're thinking. Why? Because the filters are gone. The ego no longer is there. It's aware of being aware, which means everybody's awareness is accessible to the mind, even in this localized temporal projection, because it's now aware it's the dreaming mind. For the ego will always teach that loneliness is solved by guilt and that communication is, is the cause of loneliness. You don't understand me. You don't get me. You know, because I want you to believe what I believe. I want you to see my perspective. If you don't, and then they're not communicating. And you know, we say things like someone's talking to them, say, listen to me. They are. What you mean is they don't, they're not agreeing with you. And then we learn techniques to go, mm -hmm, yes, that's very interesting. We learn all those wonderful books, but we're not really hearing why, because we're just listening to words which are symbols twice removed. And despite the evident insanity of this lesson, many have learned it and still do, and they write books about it. Forgiveness lies in communication as surely as damnation lies in guilt. It is the Holy Spirit's teaching function to instruct those who believe communication to be damned, damnation. That communication is salvation because you're in permanent communication with God, with our source. And the Holy Spirit will do so for the power of God in him and you is joined in real relationship. So holy, so strong that it can overcome even this without fear, because even this isn't there. It's just an illusion, just an hallucination. It is through the holy instant, be here now, total silence, that what seems impossible is accomplished making it evident, it always, the Holy Spirit always gives evidence, that it is not impossible. In the holy instant, the moment you connect with the Holy Spirit of God, guilt holds no attraction, since communication has been restored. Why? Because you wouldn't know the Holy Spirit and your shared being if you weren't in permanent communication. So you know it's restored because you become aware of it again. And it's not that it was ever broken, you just put filters in there, it made you, that prevented you from realizing it was always there within you, as you. And guilt, whose only purpose is to disrupt communication, has no function in the holy instant and in the holy mind, where the holy son of God recognizes himself as the shared being with God. Here there is no concealments and no private thoughts. Imagine you're dreaming and you awake in your dream and you realize you're that localized projection. If you awake in the dream, realizing these characters in your dream are all you, you will know what every single one of them is thinking. You may still be dreaming, but you're awakening to the dreaming 
to the fact that you're dreaming. And so what seems like a couple of seconds while you're awakening in space and time, but not in eternity, you have to, all of a sudden you have access to all those little characters in your dream, all their thinking minds. Why? Because you thought them all up and every single activity in your dream is held together in your mind. So you have accessibility to everyone's thoughts. Now, you know, the willingness to communicate attracts communication to it. like attracts like and overcomes loneliness completely. Because when you're not alone and you're not feeling lonely, you're feeling joined with one, the world's given you. And when you finally let go of the sense of loneliness, all of a sudden, not only are you not lonely, when, even when you're alone, people start coming into your space and, and to share love with you. There is complete forgiveness here. For there's no desire to exclude anyone from your completion because in your completion, everyone is complete and you're complete with everybody. In the sudden recognition of the value of his part in it because everyone is joined in it. In protection of your wholeness, which is what you really are, all are invited and made welcome. Why? Because all are one wholeness. It's one. And you understand that your completion is God's because you are the extension of him, whose only need is to have you be complete, or in actual fact, not to have you be complete because you are complete, but to remember that you are. For your completion makes you his in your awareness. So this is the best part. God's awareness becomes joined with yours and you, because you've never left. And here it is that you experience yourself as you were created and as you are the essence whose essential nature is the identical essence and essential nature as its creator. For you are an extension of the essence and essential nature of that which is God. And even that word now, source, the eternal joy of being eternal. Holy Son of God, you're awakening. Hope this clears something up and hope that it enriches your understanding of how we do this to one another. I'll stop here and we'll do some questions. And now we continue with the Course of Miracles text, chapter 15, the Holy Instant, and um, 15.8, the only real relationship. So the only real relationship alludes to what it is. So there's only one. The Holy Instant does not replace the need for learning, for the Holy Spirit must not leave you as your teacher until the holy instant has extended far beyond time until eternity, until you were fully awake. Because the Holy Spirit, which is the memory of God in our mind, which is the essence of God as the essence in us, is still perceived as a, either a device, learning device, or a teacher until we realize what we are, in which case it dissolves in us as as one with us, the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit become one. For a teaching, a teaching assignment such as his, he must use everything in this world for your release. So since you've made this world, he uses the world you've made like a breadcrumb that you follow back to your awakening. So he just retraces it. So he makes use of everything you've made use of to make yourself asleep, he uses to bring you back. So you'll use the relationships that you've used to, to find specialness and project your guilt and anger. He uses those to bring you. And that's why you don't let go of relationship. You make use of everything you have to remember what you are. He must side with every sign or token of your willingness to learn of him what the truth may be. And very often that sign is, there must be another way to do this. Ah, I'm so angry. You know? So he is swift to utilize whatever you offer him on behalf of his. 
his concern and care for you are limitless. There's never, it never stops. In the face of your fear of forgiveness, we fear forgiveness. Why? Because we believe we'll dissolve in the light of awareness and have no more memory of being ourselves. Or we'll lose other people when we're forgiven and they're forgiven because we can't bind them with guilt, which he perceives as clearly as he knows forgiveness is release. He will teach you to remember that forgiveness is not loss, but your salvation, because forgiveness sets you free. And that incomplete forgiveness, in which you recognize that there is nothing to forgive, you are absorbed completely. Now, the minute you get at that place of realizing, so forgiveness is the sleight of hand that brings you to the realization. So forgiveness is, sorry, let me rephrase it. Forgiveness is the one illusion that gets rid of all other illusions. Because when you get to the realization through the process of forgiveness that it's all you and therefore nothing to forgive, because you are the son of God that simply fell asleep and had a dream that never existed in God's reality. So nothing to forgive. The moment there is nothing more to forgive, think about it. When there's nothing to forgive, there's no attachment. Because we're attached while we still have to forgive. And at that moment of final non-attachment, the self is revealed and the dream dissolves in in its effect of attracting you. So even while you're in the body-mind, you don't want any of it anymore. Now it's only to serve your sleeping selves and you want to all, all of them, to, all of ourselves to return to the one self, which is the joyous peace of God. Hear him gladly and learn of him that you have no need of special relationships at all. So you don't need them. But now don't go and dump your spouse now, you know, or get rid of your kids or, or you know, you don't get rid of your parents now. All of it. You just realize, okay, if I offer these relationships to the Holy Spirit and I choose to become aware of what I am and therefore extend the love I am in being aware of what I am, what appears as family members, spouses, children, parents, partners, colleagues, start to shift as they reflect the light of awareness in me back at me. The love I am gets reflected back at me. You seek them, you seek, but you see, seek in them what you've thrown away. And through them, you will never learn the value of what you've cast aside, but still desire with all your heart. So relationships, don't throw them away because you seek in them what you've thrown away and thus it will be revealed. Let us join together in making the holy instant all there is. Because that is all there is. It's instant is forever now. By desiring that it be all there is. So it's a willingness to be shown what it truly is. You, God's son, has such great need of your willingness to strive for this that you cannot conceive of the need so great. So it's your willingness that's needed. And the son is the sonship, that the fractured sonship of the son's dreaming mind. Behold the only need that God and his son share and will meet together because since they share it, they can only share it together. You're not alone in this. The will of your creations calls to you. The world, the universe is calling to you to share your joyous being with them that they may all know that we are one shared being, joyous shared being in God and to share your will with them. Turn then in peace from guilt to God and them, because you can't love God and not love everything in which God resides, because God abides and resides in everything. Everything is spirit. You see them as bodies, but when you recognize them as spirit and as the one son of God's spirit, mind, then, then you'll truly know the love of God, not until then. You can't love God and hate the world. Because then you've, um, you've misunderstood what God is, what you are, and what the world is. The, the world is simply a misperceived projection of, of the love of God, the love of you are. When you 
stop perceiving and you start knowing, you realize it's all. It's that wonderful line by Reuben. I am spirit and I abide in God and God abides in me. That's all there is. And in that recognition, you'll realize it's all me. Offer it unconditionally that I may know myself as the love of God. Relate only with what will never leave you and what can never leave. Why would you want to relate to something which is an illusion? The loneliness of God's son is the loneliness of his father. Though God is not lonely, he wants his son to awaken. And so realize that you need to awaken in God and realize you've never left because that's all that God wills for you. Refuse not the awareness of your completion. So awareness is vital that you become aware of your completion and seek not to restore it to yourself. Okay. Fear not to give redemption over your redeemer's love. He will not fail you for he comes from the one who cannot fail. So your Redeemer's love is the Holy Spirit's reminder, the awareness of being aware in you. So fear not to give, to give the redemption over to your Redeemer because you can't do it for yourself. So offer it. Show me another way to see this. Accept your sense of failure as nothing more than a mistake in who you are. All dreaming, all illusion, all suffering stems from the fact that you know not what you are and therefore know not what your father is. For the host, the holy host of God is beyond failure and you are the holy host of God and nothing that he wills can be denied. You are forever in a relationship so holy. It calls to everyone to escape from loneliness and join you in your love because you become the light of the world that reminds them that they are the same light you are. And where you are, everyone, where you are, must everyone seek and find you there. So the minute the, the teacher for God is ready to be the light of the world, those who walk in the similar path following the bread comes back to their self. In other words, different life experiences, but we've all got the same hurt inside us. We'll find that teacher. And as they find him and he becomes the reflection of the light in them, so they become a reflection of the light in him to him. And so the teaching student relationships maximal. There's no real teacher. One just appears to be ahead, maybe in the curriculum, sharing something he's maybe read for a little longer. But there's no time. And therefore, it's just aspects of self rejoining because one aspect in time, but not in eternity, appears to be awake first, where we awake simultaneously as one in God. Thank goodness you don't awake and then have to wait in eternity because the minute you wake and time stands still. And so what would then appear as eternity as the rest awaken for you who's awake will seem instantly. Thank goodness for that. Whilst Jesus is still waiting for us to awaken 2000 years later, but in the Christ mind there's timelessness. And even this, 16 billion years of a universe feels like a billionth of a second in the Christ mind. Think but an instant on this. God gave the sonship to you. He allowed you to create, okay? To ensure your perfect creation. This was his gift. For as he with, as he, sorry, this was his gift. For as he withheld himself not from you, he withheld not his creation. So as God extends, so you extend. And he's given you the power to extend in order that you may know yourself through your mirrored extension. Nothing that it was ever created, but is yours since you dreamt it all up. Your relationship, your relationships are with the universe. It's in your mind. The universe is in your mind. And this universe, being of God, is far beyond the petty sum of all the separate bodies you perceive. You see, now, even though you've dreamt the universe, it's still of God. Why? Because without the energy of God, without the power of God, without the, the Holy Spirit of God, you wouldn't be able to manifest anything. You wouldn't be life. So even though it's in your dream, the energy that gives dimension experience to your dream is the essence of God. 
God then becomes and is the light with which you see what you have made until you realize you've made nothing, you've never left, you were just dreaming. For all its parts are joined in God through Christ, the one self that awoke to the realization he's not separate, where they become like to their father. Christ knows of no separation from his father, who is his one relationship, there's only one, in which he gives as his father gives him, which is completely and totally. There's nothing held back. The Holy Spirit is God's attempt to free you from what he does not understand. So guess what? God doesn't understand something. And what is that? Illusions, because they're not real. He doesn't understand he's the content of his son's dream. First of all, he has no idea it exists. Why? Because it'd make it real if he did. And so he doesn't understand it because it's ununderstandable. It's not true. And what's true cannot be understood. And God only knows truth. And because of the source of the attempt, it will succeed. The Holy Spirit asks you to respond as God does, completely, wholeheartedly, for he would teach you what you do not understand if you're willing to completely remember what you are. God would respond to every need, whatever form it takes. And so he keeps his channel open to receiving his communication to you and yours to him. And God's channel is the Holy Spirit. God does not understand your problem in communication. Well, he doesn't share it with you. There is no problem. It is only you who believe that it is un un understandable. Understandable. There is no problem. How can you possibly understand what doesn't exist? The Holy Spirit knows that it, it is not understandable. And yet he understands it because you made it. So he understands your illusion and understands the truth of God and takes your illusion, brings it to the light, which is God, it dissolves, and that which could never be understood becomes ununderstandable and dissolves and never existed. In the Holy Spirit alone lies the awareness of God, of what God cannot know and what you do not understand. So when you move into the awareness of being awareness itself, what happens is the Holy Spirit mind takes over and your ego mind dissolves and your Christ mind comes to the forefront because Christ is pure awareness before it's joined with God in the bliss of being. It, it is holy. It is his holy function to accept them both. And by removing every element of disagreement, to join them in one. He will do this because it is his function. So don't worry about it. Just offer it and know it will be done. It's the one time you're asked to have faith in that which you don't understand, yet the faith that you don't understand will bring the peace of God that transcends understanding into knowing. And remember, as it's been said a few times, and from experience, I this know for a fact, Every time you're willing, you get a bit of proof. And the more you're willing, the more proof you get. And the more proof you get, the more willing you become. And so it becomes a self-perpetuating series of little moments of holy instance. Holy instances is such a word. But that brings you to the holy instant. And it just becomes a glad abiding as it appears as if you're moving in the direction, but you're just sinking into your heart which is the only truth of you, where the Christ mind abides knowingly as the Son of God. Leave then what seems to you to be impossible, because it is the world of, will of God. And let him whose teachings is, is only of God teach you the only meaning of relationships. For God created the only relationship that has meaning, and that is his relationship with you because you are the extension of that which is God. You are the love of God. You are God's kingdom. You are that in which God abides as you abide in God. Let's stop here now. We'll do some questions and then we carry on. And now for the final section tonight, of course, miracles text chapter 15, the holy instant. And we do uh, 15.9. 
the holy instant and the attraction of God. As the ego would limit your perception of your brothers to the body, so would the Holy Spirit release your vision and let you see the great rays shining from them, so unlimited that they reach to God. Now, bear this in mind. As you start to awaken, the ego realizes it's losing its grip on you. So what it does is it attacks you through your pressure point, your vulnerability. So if your ego go-to mechanism as you were steeped in the ego making was anger, it will pull you into anger. If it was irritation, it'll make you irritated. If it was fearful, it'll make you fearful. If it was lonely, it'll make you feel lonely. If it was sad, it'll make you feel sad. If it was depression, it'll make, it'll, it will drive you back to the emotion which draws most your energy and takes all your attention, thereby preventing you from moving into awareness. So it needs your focus. So the, the, the dreamer, the minute he focused on the activity, he fell into the dream. The minute he releases his focus, he returns to the awareness. So ego will always get you to focus on a sensation, activity, people, place, thing, event to trigger the sensation and activity within your body, mind, awareness. Holy Spirit gets you to release, open up. And as you release, it's, it's, you're not opening the door to the light. You're opening the door of the light. You are the light. And as you open the door, the light is revealed. And it's revealed from within you, and it makes itself known. And as it makes itself known, and as you open the, the door, and the rays of light stem from your divine self, your heart space, into the world you've created. The world you've created opens its door to you, and you perceive as you see, and that's called vision. So perception, which is place, people, places, things, and events, becomes a vision, which is God becomes the light with which I see. And that's the great rays that shine from you and touch the whole world. As you abide in God, God abides you. You realize it's all abiding in my dream mind, which abides in God as spirit. It is this shift to vision that is accomplished, accomplished in the holy instant. It's the awakened awareness, aware of being aware, as the very essence of that essential nature of love of God. Yet it is needful for you to learn just what this shift entails, so you will become willing to make it permanent. Because it opens, and we have this amazing state, and we're there for a week or two or a day or a month, and then all of a sudden uh, we feel the density of the ego come. We, and, now we, and now it was just once upon a time, a tiny irritation. Because you've been in the light for so long, the smallest pebble feels like a big bump in the road. And you go, man, why is this happening? The ego realizes it's dying, meaning you're awakening to self. And the awakening to self, capital S, holy self, means the death of little self. And the ego says, Ugh! and this is why it's needful that you learn what the shift entails. So you become willing to keep going to keep inviting Holy Spirit in. Don't give up. Can't give up. It's not in you anyway. You don't have the ability to give up. But don't get despondent. Don't become discouraged. Give this willing, willingness. Given this willingness, it will leave you not, for it is permanent. Because you've now seen the light and you know the light is inside you, as you, as the extension of God's love. Once you have accepted it, as the only perception you want, because it's still perception while you're in body mind, it is translated into knowledge by the part that God Himself plays in the atonement. For it is the only step in it that He understands. So, what is the step that God plays in the atonement? It's the final step. When you've let go through forgiveness, realize there's nothing to forget, to forgive. Everything's forgotten. The recognition of ourself as the Christ, as the Holy Son of God, as the essence which abides in God, in God's essence. God says you're ready and brings you to full Christhood, into the sonship, into God. Therefore, in this there is, there will be no delay when you are ready for it. But being ready is not just saying I'm ready. It's, it's willfully letting go and doing the work 
and practicing the forgiveness. And you're going to go up and down like the ebbs and the tides of the ocean. You're going to feel like you're leaving it and then they're going to come back. It's okay. It's okay. Be as you are. Be willing. Be willing to be shown. Call for help of the Holy Spirit, of your brothers, of your siblings, of your mighty companions. Get on the phone. Call. Explain. It's not about storytelling. It's call. It's it's okay to cry for love. Because when you cry, love responds in your brothers, in the Holy Spirit. And as you, it responds to you, so you'll respond to the cry for love on others. God is ready now, but you are not. Well, God is ready now is a little bit of a play. God is always ready. You just need to release. Our task is but to continue as fast as possible. The necessary process of looking straight at all interference and seeing it exactly as it is. Now, I don't have to explain this to you guys too much because you I, we've practiced this before. It's the direct part. It's the self-inquiry. To whom does this thought appear? Where does this thought come from? No, thanks. Don't engage in the thought. Don't try and prevent the thought. Just simply don't engage. If you give it no attention, it needs your attention because it needs energy. And your attention is energy you feed it. You give it attention, you go into the thought, you start playing the thought, it traps you. Awareness. Awareness doesn't dissolve and disappear. Awareness just subsides because you've taken your awareness of being aware, focuses on the activity. Awareness seems to subside. The awareness is always there. Take your focus away from the activity, from the thought. Return to stillness. The awareness rises. For the awareness is always there. You, the awareness is the essence of self, of the Holy Spirit, of the Christ mind, of God. You're aware of the essence, aware of being awareness itself. Essence, awareness, same thing. For it is impossible to recognize as holy without gratification, what you think you want. Because if you knew, you, you would have it. What do you want? To be the joyous expression of the love of God. And to know that you have it. To be is to have. The body is the symbol of the ego, as the ego is the symbol of separation. And both or nothing, nothing more than attempts to limit communication, the awareness of being aware that you're always the awareness of God, and thereby to make it impossible. For communication must be unlimited in order to have meaning. And deprived of meaning, it will not satisfy you completely. And that's why the ego loves to appropriate the idea of spirituality, turn you into an identification of being a seeker, and then you seek. And 20 years later, you're still seeking. One retreat to the next, one course to the next, one self-help to the next, getting no further because as soon as you get an answer, it gets misappropriated by the ego, turned into more questions and you never be still and, and know I am because the ego loves to ask questions and loves to study itself. Hell, it loves to study itself. We've made a whole career out of it called psychology and, and then in the branches thereof and now there's coaching and there's mentoring and there's blah, 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 blah. Yet it remains the only means by which you can establish real relationships, which have no limits, having been established by God. For communication must be unlimited, which have no limits, having been established by God. For communication has, must be unlimited, because God is unlimited. And therefore, unlimited in meaning means no limits. For you abide in God as God abides in you. No limit. It's eternal. It's forever. In the holy instant where the great rays, love that line, replace the body in awareness, God is the light in which I see. The recognition of relationships without limits is given you. So not, relationships are no longer activities whereby you can get because it becomes offer all to all. But in order to see this, it is necessary to give up every use the ego has for the body and to accept the fact that the ego has no purpose you would share with it because the ego's only purpose is body to hold other bodies in guilt and thereby keep you bound in guilt too. And their guilt forgetfulness of what you truly are. 
for the ego would limit everyone to a body for its own purpose. And while you think it has a purpose, your body, you will choose to utilize the means by which it tries to turn purpose into accomplishment. Now let's take this into look at me. I, oh, my purpose is bigger than yours. Anything you do, I can do better. Anything you do, I can do better than you. So now we now in purpose. Now I can be more enlightened. I can I can enlighten others faster. I can give you a miracle course, you know, and if you come and do my miracle course, you'll awaken quicker. It's because it's a miracle course. The course is miraculous itself. Teach us for God. This will never be accomplished. Never. Yet you have surely re recognized that the ego whose goals are altogether unattainable, because as soon as you reach one, you need the next, will strive for them with all its might and will do so with the strength you've given it. And what strength you give it? The attention. Why? Because the minute you give a, an, an activity that makes you feel bad, whatever it is, anger, guilt, fear, sadness, loneliness, the minute you give that thought attention, it energizes. And, and you become so accustomed to that sensation, fear, some guilt, loneliness, sadness, whatever, anger, that you don't know how to live without it. It, it feeds you. And even though you hate being there when you're there, you don't know how to be without it. And you can't even imagine life without it, even though you want to get rid of it. So it's the guilt, and then you feel guilty for feeling guilt. Let go. Ask to be shown. Can't do it on your own. It's impossible. You've created it. You've created the maze in which you've trapped yourself. You can't get out of the maze in which you've created to trap yourself. Ask. It is impossible, and this is what it means to be right or wrong-minded, to be divided, to divide your strength between heaven and hell, God and the ego, and to release your power to creation, which is the only purpose for which it was given you, to extend the love of God eternally. Love would always give increase, always, because it always extends. Limits are demanded by the ego and represents its demands to make little and ineffectual little body mind. Limit your sight of a brother to his body, which you, which you will do as long as you would not release it from him and you would have denied his gift to you because in you choosing to see him as a repressor or the person who hurt you or whatever you bind him to, you prevent yourself from realizing not only what he is, holy son of God, holy son of God. His body cannot give it and seek it not through yours. And yet what do we demand on our brothers in every relationship? That they show up in body and act in body and give in body. Yet your mind's already continuous and the union need only be accepted, and the loneliness in heaven is gone. Loneliness in heaven, not heaven there. Heaven, you, your heart, the heart that feels lonely, gone. Heaven is your heart, not out there. There's nowhere there. It's all you. Yeah, yeah, be and now. If you would but let the Holy Spirit tell you of the love of God for you, and the need of your creations have to be with you forever, you would, you would experience the attraction of the eternal. So the whole world is your creation. If you love it not, it needs your love. To know it is love as you are. And you need it because through it, it reflects the love you are. So don't hate the world. Don't denounce it. Don't push away from it. Anyone that, that you hate prevents you from knowing what you are. Everyone that you fear prevents you from knowing what you are. No one can hear him speak of this and long remain willing to linger here. Because why would you now that you know? Which is your will to be in heaven, be knowingly abiding in your heart, where you are complete and quiet, quiet, very quiet, in such sure and loving relationship that any limit is impossible because it's eternal. And what is eternal is not limited. Would you not exchange your littleness, this little body mind for this? Of course we would. But don't fear it, because then that's what prevents it. For the body is little and limited. And only those whom you would see without the limits of the ego 
would impose on them can offer you the gift of freedom. So don't limit this little body because then it imposes you. And don't impose it on them because then it imposes you. It's all you. You have no concept of the limits you have placed on your perception and no idea of all the loveliness you could see. And it's not really seeing, it's just the knowing of it, but symbolically seeing. But this you must remember. The attraction of guilt opposes the attraction of God. So whenever the thought comes, it wants to get your attention. Now, the minute you give that thought attention, you've taken your awareness off God, which is the awareness of the joy, love, and light that you've always wanted to experience and that you've sought your whole life to gain through people, places, things, and events by making them feel guilty. So now you're letting go, no more attention to that, and you just abide, and it lifts you because it becomes you, and it gives you proof, and the more you want it, the more it becomes, the more it becomes, the more you extend it, the more you extend it, the more you become it. And then one day you put the body down and now you return to the Christ mind and you light up the mind a little more. And everyone, as you become Christ in the mind, the mind reflects more of a light. And so every generation, what appears to be space time is awakening more and more. Why? More and more individualized, localized, fractured projections are dissolving and the light of awareness, and joining the light of awareness. Just imagine a big concert hall in complete darkness. And there's a thousand people in this concert hall, but no one can see anyone. They're all afraid. And they've all got something in their hand, but they have no idea. And then one person goes, that's a candle. And the minute you light your candle in a dark hall, five, ten people around you realize they've got a candle too, that they're, they're holding a candle. You just lean in. The next thing you're spreading the light. And that's what's happening. That's the light Christ mind in the dark mind. And that mind, that light, that mind it becomes lit. The next one becomes lit. The next one becomes lit. Before you know it, the whole mind is awake. But this you must remember. The attraction of guilt opposes the attraction of God. That's it. Done. Be still and know. His attraction for you remains unlimited. But, but because your power being, but because your power being his is as great as his, you can turn away from love. And God can't force you to go there, not only because he gives you free will, but because you also have the power to keep yourself asleep. Because God is the power, which is the essence of what you are. The power of God is in you. What you invest in guilt, you withdraw from God. And your sight grows weak and dim and limited, for you have attempted to separate the Father from the Son and limit their communication. And yet, this power that you're limiting cannot be limited. You're so powerful. You created the entire universe. You, the dreamer, not you, the individualized projection. You're the projection of the dreamer. He projected this too. He created your body, your parents the entire planet, the entire universe, in one mind. That's how powerful the Son of God is because he's given the same power as the Father. The Father extends his power through the Son. Seek not atonement in further separation. Don't hide. Don't go and be the monk who hides in a cave. There'll be a time when you need to recede and you'll need to rest and you'll need to recharge. But when it calls you, pour back into the world joyously. If not, I wouldn't be here. I'd be, I went through a period of quiet 10 years. 10 years. But eventually the Holy Spirit just started bubbling out. And this is the way it came out, these forums. And limit, and limit not your vision of God's Son to what interferes with his release. So be careful for those irritations. Be careful for those things that pull you back into anger or sadness. Be careful to pull yourself back into listening to storytelling where people are woe and move sad. It's a really just a cry for love. But if you're not ready and you go there, they'll drag you into those stories. And because of your empathy, okay, which is just ego, you'll get pulled into their ego. Yes, empathy is ego. And what the Holy Spirit must undo to set him free, okay, God's son to what interferes with his release and what the Holy Spirit must undo to set him free. 
So limit not. Just hand it over. Limit not your vision of God's Holy Son to what interferes for his release. Don't go there. Choose another way. Choose another way. Choose another way. You've got limitless time. Limitless opportunity where his belief in limits has imprisoned him. When the body ceases to attract you, when you place no value on it as a means of getting anything, then there will be no interference in communication and thoughts. And, and your thoughts will be free as God's. And as you let the Holy Spirit teach you how to use the body only for purposes of communication, this is what we're doing, listening and learning, and which is really just remembering, and renounce its use for separation and attack, which the ego sees in it, you will learn you have no need of a body at all. In the holy instant, there are no bodies, and you experience only the attraction of God, the very essence of God. Accepting it as undivided, you join him wholly in an instant. The reality of this relationship becomes the only truth you'll ever want, and all truth is here. And this brings me straight to that wonderful lesson, which I'm going to take a little bit of poetic license and twist it ever so slightly. This holy instant I give to you, that I may be released from my part. This holy instant I give to you. Be you in charge, Holy Spirit, that I may know you. No longer follow, because I know you as well. Certain that abiding in you, I will know my strength, which is the power of God. In total certainty, know myself as my brothers. Amen. We stop here. Um, I'll look at my schedule. I'm going to try and do Sunday again. I'll post it on the group. I'll post it on Facebook by the latest uh, Saturday morning. I'll try and uh, aim at Friday afternoon. So if I can free up my, my Sunday, um, I will... We'll do this again on Sunday, same time, 5.45, 6 p.m. Thank you for joining me. And I hope that this has brought you into a deeper understanding and recognition of the love you are as the self, the Christ, that which abides in God, that in which God abides. You're not a body, you are free, for you're still as God created you. Thank you for joining me.